from the technology found on the starships to the strange new life forms found on different planets, Trek just sprinkles just enough science within all the techno babble to make those worlds seem just that bit more realistic and also immersive. So with that in mind, I'm Ellie with Trek Culture here with 10 examples of real science in Star Trek. Number 10, silicon-based life. All of life on Earth is carbon-based. Carbon is perfect for biology because of its abundance and its ability to maintain four valence bonds with other elements, especially hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and other carbon elements. And these types of bonds make up most of the biological molecules that allow life to exist. While it is true that carbon can create more possible molecules than any other element on the periodic table by a long shot, many scientists theorize that aliens that evolved on a different planet may also be silicon based. Silicon, like carbon, can form four stable bonds with itself and other atoms and can create long chemical chains known as silane polymers, which are very similar to hydrocarbons, an essential ingredient of life made with carbon. But the two elements are still vastly different. Silicon is far more reactive to chemicals like oxygen, so silicon-based life may not be possible in reality, but the rampant scientific speculation around silicon-based life led to one appearing in Star Trek. In Star Trek, the original series episode, The Devil in the Dark, the Enterprise crew encountered a silicon-based life form known as the Horta. The Horta is one of the strangest creatures ever encountered by Starfleet, with an appearance more similar to molten rock than a living animal. Number nine, fusion impulse engines. The main propulsion system of Starfleet ships, impulse engines, are powered by nuclear fusion. And these engines are what the ships use to navigate whenever they're not at warp. Nuclear fusion is when atoms merge together under immense pressure, releasing their excess mass as energy. It happens every second in the sun due to incredibly high gravity and is the source of the sun's light. Earth's gravity is much too weak for fusion to take place, but scientists have been able to induce nuclear fusion in labs using extreme temperatures and pressure. Unfortunately, so far, no experiment has been able to produce more energy than it costs to induce the fusion. In other words, there is no net power gain. But apparently, at some point in the Star Trek timeline, prior to the 22nd century, scientists managed to perfect nuclear fusion, and ever since then, every ship in the fleet had a fusion-powered impulse engine. Number 8. Subspace Communication now, subspace is an entirely fictional concept, but it was created by the writers to explain a very real scientific issue with Starfleet's interstellar communication. Now, without using a warp drive or any other fictional device, nothing can travel faster than light through the universe. But Starfleet ships often communicate with Earth or other planets when they're hundreds of light years away. If these signals traveled merely at the speed of light, the communications would have centuries of lag. Real-time conversations would be impossible, and it's for this reason that the writers came up with subspace, another dimension layered on top of ours, likely inspired by the extra spatial dimensions proposed in superstring theory. In the subspace dimension, energy can travel faster than light. Communications are sent through subspace and then back into normal space when they arrive, allowing for instant face-to-face -face interactions across light years. Now, subspace communication does have a limited range though, which is why Voyager couldn't simply send a message to Starfleet Command when they got lost in the Delta Quadrant. But it is extremely effective and used quite often within Federation space. Number seven, the size of the galaxy. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, was actually portrayed rather faithfully in Star Trek. Just like in real life, the galaxy is about 100,000 light years across and contains hundreds of billions of stars. Most stars are at least a light year apart from each other and contain at least one planet. The location of Earth is also just where it should be, positioned halfway between the galactic core and the edge of the galaxy. There are, however, a number of scientific inaccuracies with the Milky Way in Star Trek. For example, it's been known for quite some time now that at the center of our galaxy, and presumably all galaxies, there is a supermassive black hole. In Star Trek, this is not the case. 
As we see in Star Trek V The Final Frontier, the center of the Milky Way in Star Trek is actually a hidden planet known in Vulcan mythology as Shakari. Cybok, Spock's half-brother, believed this planet to be the home of God and the source of all creation. Unfortunately for him, it turned out to be merely the home of one very angry alien entity. The fate of this mysterious planet in the galactic core is yet to be explored. Number 6. Technological Telepathy when the Borg were first introduced in the Next Generation episode Q-Who, the idea of enabling telepathy or mind reading with technology was nothing more than a fantasy. Nowadays, as neural implants get more and more advanced, companies such as Neuralink claim to be close to making technological telepathy a reality. Already, Neuralink has shown that its test implants can allow a monkey to control a computer using just its brain. Now, the wires from the implants connect to parts of the brain that fire off electrical signals. And these connections allow for information to be interpreted into data by a computer. So theoretically, in the future, these signals could be sent and received between two Neuralink users, and therefore they can communicate using just their brains. The collective itself is a society of millions of Borg drones connected telepathically with each other. Number five, Bassard Collectors. Although we often think of space as a perfect vacuum devoid of any matter, interstellar space actually contains about one atom per cubic centimeter on average. Starfleet's vessels are some of the only ships in sci-fi to use this interstellar dust. The ship's Bassard collectors, the red devices usually positioned at the ends of the nacelles, collect this dust as the ship travels through space. These particles are then used to replenish the ship's fuel. The Bassard collectors can even be fine-tuned to filter for specific elements needed at that moment. While interstellar space contains few particles, the ships would often be able to scoop up huge quantities very quickly by traveling at high impact pulse speeds or by visiting a nearby nebula. Inside nebulae and solar systems, the ambient particle density is much higher. And because of this constant replenishment of particles, it means that Starfleet ships are able to remain in deep space for longer periods of time without needing to restock on basic materials like nitrogen gas. Number 4. Antimatter Photon Torpedoes now, antimatter is real and has been produced on numerous occasions by CERN, but at a very high cost. Every particle has an antiparticle, which is exactly the same as the particle in every way, except it has an opposite charge. So, for example, an electron has a negative charge and a positron has a positive charge. Matter and antimatter reactions are believed to be the most efficient source of energy in the entire universe, due to 100% of the fuel being converted into usable energy. That is why this interaction of matter and antimatter is what powers the photon torpedoes in Star Trek. Now, so far, CERN has only been able to produce small quantities of antimatter atoms, but considering that one half a gram of antimatter is enough to create an explosion even bigger than the nuclear bomb dropped in Hiroshima in 1945, it's probably a good thing that it's so rare. Number 3. Inertial Dampeners in space, there is no gravity or atmosphere to slow objects to a halt, so anything that moves in empty space will continue along its path forever without stopping or slowing down. Now, many, many sci-fi franchises just blatantly ignore inertia in space. Now, often you'll see a spaceship run out of fuel and it'll gradually slow down until eventually it stops, when in reality, if a spaceship runs out of fuel, it will just continue moving at the speed it was already moving at. Now, Star Trek explains this by including inertial dampeners on all Starfleet ships. These small thrusters located all over the ship counteract the effects of inertia by producing an artificial drag on the vessel. They also assist with slowing down acceleration and deceleration to prevent the people inside from being launched out of their seats when changing speed too quickly. Number 2. Building Ships in Space Many times in Star Trek, we've seen ships being constructed in space. Voyager, for example, was launched from a space dock at the Utopia Planitia shipyards in orbit of Mars. This zero-gravity environment was perfect for large-scale construction projects like building a starship. Working in zero gravity has so many real-world benefits. Weightlessness means that large components of the ship, such as the nacelles or the saucer section, can be transported with very little force. It also means that crew are able to experiment and are free to experiment with different engine designs without the 
fear of destroying a planet's ecosystem if something goes wrong. Frankly, the only reason we don't build our spaceships in space today is because we lack the infrastructure. But this infrastructure is currently being developed. With the upcoming Artemis missions that plan to establish a permanent base on the moon and talks of mining asteroids in the works, it likely won't be long before we see the first ship constructed entirely in space. Number 1. Warp Drive Albert Einstein's special theory of relativity proved conclusively that nothing in the universe can move faster than light. For a while, it was assumed for this reason that interstellar travel would forever be impossible, or at the very least take thousands of years, considering how far apart stars are from each other. And even if the ships could travel at velocities near the speed of light, they would go through drastic time dilation and experience time much slower than people on Earth. Fortunately, it was discovered that there existed a loophole in Einstein's calculations. While it is true that nothing can move faster than light, space itself can expand and contract. So, if one was to expand the distance behind the ship and shorten the distance in front of the ship, one could traverse at the same distance in less time. And this is how Star Trek's warp drives work. The ship itself is not moving faster than light. The space around the ship is merely bending to allow these distances to be shortened. Many scientists now believe that a warp drive is the only method of faster than light travel that could be possible in reality. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed something, then please do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and hit that notification bell. And while we've got your attention, we are so close to 250,000 subscribers here on YouTube. All we want for Christmas is you. Specifically, 3,000 of you so we can hit that mark by Christmas. Also, head over to Twitter and follow us there and Instagram as well. And I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. I've been Ellie with Trek Culture. I hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, to boldly go where no one has gone before.